Is this on? Is this on? No. Um, there we go. Um, can I have your attention? Can I have your attention? So, so thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Brian Strom. I'm Chancellor uh, of uh, Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences. I'd like to congratulate you all on being the privileged ones being here. This event apparently filled up within hours of, 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 of it opening. So, so the, the, there clearly is enormous interest. So uh, good morning. I think it's still morning by a few minutes. Um, and welcome to today's Academic Health Symposium, Creating a National Center uh, of Excellence for Integrated Healthcare Delivery and Behavioral Health. This is the third event in a series of topical sessions on specific health-related issues, which include challenges to the healthcare system, aging, global health, cancer, and today's subject, behavioral healthcare. Uh, these events are designed to highlight areas where Rutgers and RWJ Barnabas Health uh, have demonstrated strengths in research and clinical care. Today, we've assembled another of our distinguished panels of experts to present on behavioral health, including the importance of behavioral health in primary care and population health, a major paradigm shift in the delivery of health care, and in the process, highlight a key service line which cuts across the academic health system, both uh, on the academic side and on the, the clinical service side. With our statewide platform of health professions education, the uh, Big Ten biomedical research infrastructure, our national brand name recognition and reputation, and this historic collaboration with our health system partners, RWJ uh, Barnabas Health. These are the building blocks of an academic health center of national caliber. We're very proud today to present to you this program on an important healthcare issue that impacts so many of our patients, families, and friends. Uh, I would remind people as a talk, not only is the select group that's here in the audience, but this is also being broadcast on the web. So please make sure you're talking into the microphone and when there are questions and so on later that you're talking into the microphone as well because the audience is, is much broader than just people here in the room. At this point, it's my pleasure to introduce the president and CEO of RWJ, uh, Barnabas Barastrowski, to say a few words, and my partner in crime. So thank you. <laughs> I'm only up here because I'm so thrilled to be speaking at something called an academic health symposium. <laughs> My mother, who's 95, loves to hear me recite that this is what I'm doing. Um, thank you all for being here, and thank you for your interest in this particular topic. You know, it's interesting, for those of us that have toiled in healthcare for a long time, we did so by rejecting any focus on behavioral health and how it needs to be integrated with what we can call conventional clinical care. And we had all kinds of excuses as to why we did that. No one understood it. The reimbursement was not right. Uh, and yet we continued to kick the can down the road. And finally, because I think of your focus and your commitment and the fact that you understand that we can't go on another day in this world without, without concentrating on how these two great needs are integrated, we're going to do something about it. And the fact that we, quote, are going to do something about it is really the driving force behind this great partnership between Rutgers and RWJ Barnabas Health. Doing something is what we aspire to have happen. Um, we have researched, we have evaluated, we have studied, we've created white papers. Uh, now it's time to really get down to helping those that, we, that need our help, improving the health of the communities that we serve, and this particular topic and this particular initiative is integral and critical if we're ever going to attain that mission goal. So um, for me, listening to the great experts we have and understanding it better, and for Brian and I to go out and make sure that our colleagues both understand it and motivate each other to get it done is what the work is that's ahead of us. And so without ego and without who gets credit, uh, the answer ultimately be, will be, have we improved the health of those who live in our communities? And I think thanks to that which you'll discuss today and the plans that will evolve from it, we shall do just that. So welcome, enjoy the program, and we'll speak later. Thank you. Good, uh, good mid morning. I'm Frank Ganassi, and thank you, Barry, and thank you, Brian, for the introductions on this. Uh, so, we're very pleased today to have a group of six individuals who are going to share experiences about their delivery of integrated care. As most of you know, 
Um, and I, I took a, a moment this morning to, to take a quick look at the NIH site and some things that are current on that site with respect to integrated care is that primary care currently delivers about half of all the behavioral health care in the country. That's a conservative estimate. Um, it turns out that most individuals with behavioral health disorders are currently not being treated by psychiatric specialty practices. That's a reality already. And about 75% of all adult patients with depression who see primary health care providers are either underdiagnosed or improperly diagnosed uh, in, in those settings. Untreated behavioral health disorders currently by NIMH estimates uh, indicate that individuals are dying between 15 and 30 years earlier than their peers because of untreated behavioral health comorbidities as a result of this. Most kids who are being treated in pediatric practices uh, begin to experience behavioral health disorders around the age of 14, and very often these also go unnoticed. And even when they do go noticed, if the solution is to refer to a primary care or primary behavioral health care service, uh, less than half ever make the first appointment, and of those who do make the first appointment, less than half of them actually show for it. So you're, you're getting a, a tremendous amount of undertreatment. The other con concern about this is that individuals with common chronic physical health conditions also tend to have statistically much higher rates of behavioral health disorder. You know, we've been trying to undo the Cartesian split for about 500 years now, and that mind-body split has never really served medicine. The idea of carving out behavioral health from physical health was, I think, a financial decision, not necessarily a good care condition. And so our labor now is to try to undo that split. Um, the other thing to think about is that many of the current physical health conditions that plague America these days are issues uh, like asthma, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, HIV, COPD, and metabolic syndrome, all of which <coughs> involve the individual willingly participating in behavioral health or physical health care maintenance. It also means habit management and adhering to those levels of care uh, are not as simple as writing a prescription and handing it to the patient. So having that behavioral health expertise embedded within primary care, pediatric, and geriatric practices helps to ensure that those behaviors are going to happen. We believe that the integration of this care, along with many people across the country, not only provides better quality of care, we believe it provides better outcomes. We also think it's more efficient, and financially we believe it's going to produce better savings because of earlier identification of the problems, getting the right treatment to the patient the first time, and integrating the behavioral health. So historically, almost, although most primary care providers have treated mental health disorders, they really haven't had the time or resources to do it with this level of 360. So what you're going to hear today are a variety of examples of it actually happening in real time here. Now I want to make a disclaimer at the very beginning. This is in no way an exhausting list of all the places and people across the Barnabas system or the Rutgers system where this is happening. Similar things are happening uh, with Anna Natal Piera up in Newark. They're happening with Chantal Brazo in Newark. They're happening with Sue Von Nessen, uh, Scanlon, and the nursing department. And there are countless other examples within the Barnabas system. But what I want you to, to do is take this opportunity to focus on these six views of it, and then we're going to engage in a robust discussion. But before we do that, let me turn it over to Jen to give you another perspective. Oh, one last thing, Jen, as you come up, there's one slide, yeah. So you have to do one slide where you say, I'm sorry, you can't read this. Um, and this is the obligatory slide. So if you look at NIH right now, what you're going to see, and, we, and this was as large as we could make it, what you're going to see is that there really are three large categories of the way care is delivered. So traditionally, coordinated care really is care that happens in two different sites, but an attempt is made to coordinate it by phone or emails or texts. It's the traditional model. It's been wholly insufficient, and it's been terribly unhelpful. Over the last 10 to 15 years, you've seen more and more what's called co-located care, which is really two individuals in sight. And the joke about that is that the behavioral health person is usually named Sally or John. They're at the end of the hallway in an office with a plant and a window, and you send people down there, and nobody knows what happens when they go. Um, and that's sort of co-located care. Most of you are aware of that. You may have even served in one of those roles. 
What you're going to be hearing about today is the third model, which is a truly integrated practice. These are teams that work together on a single treatment plan. They share an electronic health record. The goals and objectives are uh, both designed and delivered in a team fashion, and that's the aspirational goal. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Jen. Good morning, everyone. I'm following Frank Ganassi because I always have his back. It has been really such a joy um, as our systems have come together to work with Frank. And I think it's evident just from a few moments here that he has a depth of understanding and experience to really lead our behavioral health strategy. Um, and so thank you, Frank, for all that you bring to, to both systems, actually. And so I'm looking forward uh, to continuing to work together. Um, We've assembled for you a panel of experts, each having pursued integration from different vantage points. Frank mentioned that earlier, and they're really very unique vantage points, which kind of adds to the complexity of what it means to be integrated truly. But there's a common theme that really runs through each of them, um, each of any of us who pursue integration, and that is you really need to be relentless. And I have a particular personal hero who's been completely relentless, relentless in advancing the integration of mental health care with physical health, and it's uh, Dr. Benjamin Miller, who I first met when he was an associate professor at the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. And now he's the chief strategy officer for Wellbeing Trust. And a few years ago, we invited Dr. Miller to come speak with us, and actually some of our Rutgers colleagues at the time as well, regarding strategies to advance integration. And he discussed essentially four issues. One is you have to change the culture of the what, the how, and the why to integrate behavioral health. The second is payment reform, for sure. The third is there are serious workforce issues that we must address. And the third is community-based prevention. So the challenges to accomplish or resolve each of those are real, but certainly the goal to do so um, is non-negotiable. And related to this goal is simply making access and affordability of mental health care easier for everyone. And the path forward is really a set of recommendations that it's not really unfamiliar to any of us. There really should be no wrong door for access to care. There has to be consistency with how mental health conditions are identified. To the extent that co-pays are part of anyone's insurance benefit, they really should be the same for mental health as for physical health services. States need to enforce parity laws. And nationally, we need to recognize that we have to redesign how we pay for mental health and substance use treatment to really ensure we have preventative care, team-based care, and the delivery of the highest quality care. And while much has been done even to react and respond to the recent or the ongoing opioid crisis, for example, much really needs to be done to ensure that the vision for integrated care manifests in sound policy decisions reformed clinical practices, some of which you'll hear about today, and a redesigned payment structure. Um, and if I can admit, as a former regulator in government, I'm all too familiar with what we did to promote wellness and recovery for people with mental illness. Peggy Swarbrick's here. She was a champion in that regard for sure. But I also know that which we didn't do, which was to advance integration as soon as it was practicable into our public benefit. And Frank's right, largely states make those decisions for financial reasons. And we see today the outcomes of that, and that is that we've got two different systems that really do need to come together and be aligned. Not coordinated, not co-located, co but truly integrated. So I'm so thrilled that today's panel will actually get into the details of some of what, some of what those challenges are. And then thankfully, there's much being done in this regard to really advance that ball down the field. And then New Jersey will join the ranks of other states who have really begun to do these efforts in er to accomplish these goals in earnest. Um, it was encouraging to see, I should say as a footnote, as a quick shout out to my former, to my government colleagues, the state is doing some things now to advance um, the reduction of barriers and support wellness and recovery, particularly with respect to some licensing issues that the Department of Health announced recently. So at this time, I am happy to introduce our panelists who will share their different perspectives and deep expertise in this uh, pursuit of integration. And then we really do hope to reserve some time today for your questions, because I think that much of what will be said today will hopefully provoke some really interesting dialogue around the pursuit of integration. So thank you for that. And at this time, I'd welcome our panelists up to the stage to be seated. And we will 
begin this discussion with someone who was new to RWJ Barnabas Health, Dr. Eliza Ng, who's our Chief Medical Officer for Population Health. And it's really apropos as we think about population health and all that that means um, to have the perspective about what it means to integrate behavioral health into that practice model. So thank you, Dr. Ng. Thank you. Hi, good, mor good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm just so honored to be here. Um, I, I'm an OBGYN by training, so there's no behavioral health issues in OB, so I don't even know what I'm doing here. Um, but, but all joking aside, um, it's always really humbling when I'm at a podium, especially with experts who, who are in their field, because as a population health person, as we call pop health people, um, my role is really to be the facilitator, integrator, and try to help create a payment model many times to support the, the, the amazing work that um, the healthcare systems are trying to do. So in terms of behavioral health, um, I'm by no means an expert, but I've had the fortunate opportunity to work with many smart people around New York and um, Northeast to implement uh, integrated behavioral health care. And so, thank you. Um, love to just share with you some of my observations uh, as an imposter. So first of all, I would like to just take a few moments to just level set. Um, I find that population health can mean many different things to different people. And um, just like to share with you my view of what population health is and why behavioral health care, especially integrated behavioral health care is extremely important. Um, in some ways, I see it as fundamental, and, and you'll see what I mean by that. So, so what's pop health? Why pop health? Um, it was really born out of the urgency that the healthcare system is broken, right? We spend a tremendous amount of money and dollars in healthcare, $3.5 trillion. I have no idea how many zeros there is, but it's a lot of money. We spend that is 2.7 times more we spend than education in this country, and 4.7 times more than our military defense budget. So just imagine if, if we can save a 1% point of that, how, how much can we improve on societal welfare? Despite the cost, though, our outcomes are lousy. If you look at all health indicators across, I can't think one, if you can, please raise your hand, that we are superior than any other OECD countries. Oh, by the way, um, if 20 miles up north, um, our maternal mortality rate and premature de death rate is actually worse than those in many parts of Africa. So it doesn't make sense. So that begs the question, why? So of course it's very complicated, right? Um, but early on in my career, I've really subscribed to Kindig and his colleagues' observation that healthcare delivery is only can only impact health outcomes at best 10 to 20 percent, right? What else? It's human biology. It's the social and environmental conditions. It's health behaviors, it's health attitudes. So that leads to the basis of population health, right? And that, that in order to really truly impact health outcomes, we have to address the modifiable factors, the social determinants, the environmental factors, um, health behaviors and modify health risks. This model then, through these observations, models have been developed, right, in population health, with the intervention goals that are very simple. You keep the healthy people healthy, you identify those who are at risk and give them tools to manage their health behaviors and risk factors, and you provide support to those who are sick and in need so that they can be cared for appropriately. That's it, it's very simple. It's very humanistic and holistic. It doesn't separate people by disease conditions, by insurance type, by zip codes. 
And it's very much dependent on a notion that the person, the actor, has to be activated and engaged. But that's why behavioral health is so important, right? So behavioral health as a comorbidity drives complexity, but also it's very hard to be engaged as, as an actor if you have um, behavioral health conditions that affects your ability to engage. So true to this model, we have to truly integrate behavioral health and behavioral, uh, physical health. So as Jen has said, we, we can't do it under the current systems of separate and unequal systems of care. So f there's no interoperability. So structurally, um, many systems across the country are still very separate. The physical health provider sits on one side and the behavioral health provider sits in a different system. And many times they don't even operate under the same EHR. The way behavioral health paid for, again, I've said, are separate. In the state, we have different government agencies that governs um, the, the, the two entities. And very often, I think it's the norm, insurance plans still separate the two entities. And as, and as um, it's been said, it's mostly financially driven. So if you look at, I don't know how many, I'm looking at my insurance card right now, and in the back, it has three different numbers, um, dental care, physical care, and behavioral health care. Three different 1-800 numbers. So do we really think that these systems talk to each other? Right? If I have schizophrenia or on a medication, do we think that my physical health providers will know that I'm at high risk of diabetes? Probably not, right? So, so it's important that we integrate structurally the two systems of care. In fact, it was so egregious in 20 years ago that health insurance company discriminate against the, the physical health benefits and, and, and in, that we have to implement parity law in order to address the issue at the federal level. So access to behavioral health remains a very large issue, especially amongst those who with inability to pay. Um, Medicaid rate reimbursement is very low, and it's, it's a problem. An average wait time is more than 35 days currently for those with commercial insurance, and much, much more for those with Medicaid insurance. Um, in fact, in my previous life, when I oversee a health plan in New York, we were only able, for instance, to find one child psychiatrist to care for our entire Long Island population. We didn't even, we were scared to find out what the wait time was because we knew that it wouldn't be up to snuff. Access to providers is a problem. And even if care is available, there remains a problem in terms of ability to complete care. Life gets in the way. There's stigma in behavioral health. Health literacy often intervenes with one's ability to understand the importance. So from a population health framework perspective, it is really critical to integrate behavioral health because it, it meets the needs of many in one setting. For those who are healthy, if we integrate behavioral health into primary care or other type setting, we can promote better screening. And for those who are at risk, we can provide additional self-management tools for people to manage their wellness and identify stressors that could trigger their conditions. And those with high needs, the integrated team can then act as an integrator between their physical health and behavioral health teams. Integration care can be delivered in multiple ways, and you can hear from the panel um, how different models are done. It could be delivered in behavioral health care setting, primary care setting, OBGYN setting, home setting, long-term care setting. And because of the nature of behavioral health, um, more and more so that technology plays an important role in integrating care, in facilitating communications between care team, 
And we will see a lot more of how technology can really enable and improve access to behavioral care um, more and more so in the future. I'm hopeful. I know that we are moving towards the right direction. And I'm very grateful to have the ability to work in a system that really believes in the integration and are investing in resources so that I can help facilitate some the care uh, from a population health perspective. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Steve Levin, and um, I really appreciate being invited to talk about um, how Eric B. Chandler Health Center integrated behavioral health into our primary care practice in the last one and a half years or so. Um, I'm not somebody that's generally prone to making exaggerated statements, but I'm going to make one. Um, and that is that I would say that our integration of behavioral health into our primary care practice is perhaps the most transformative process improvement that I have participated in in my 30 years as a family physician, maybe short of the um, transition to the electronic health record, but on that level in terms of what I've seen. Um, so just, you know, my role in, in the, on the panel is to talk a little bit of the details of integrating behavioral health. Um, so first let me tell you briefly about Eric B. Chandler Health Center. It's a federally, federally qualified health center, part of the federal community health center network. There's 1,200 um, community health center organizations in the country, and they deliver primary care to approximately 12% of Americans. Um, they, the federal program provides the health centers with grant dollars. In exchange, we comply with their model of care and uh, you know, quality standards and, um, of course, see patients regardless of ability to pay. Our center provides um, a pro over 50,000 medical and dental visits a year um, to patients of all payment forms. About half our patients have Medicaid, about 40% are uninsured, and then there's some Medicare and a tiny bit of commercial insurance there. So, so where were we and how did we get there and where are we now? So where we were was that we had, according to the diagram up there, a co-located type of care model. We had a social services department um, who would see patients who were referred for having mental health problems or issues with uh, social determinants. And um, those patients uh, were referred by written referral. The appointment was scheduled sometime into the future. And as Frank said, um, they were taken down the hall through a locked door um, into an office that had a window and a plant. Um, but anyway, um, it wasn't necessarily the most uh, successful model because um, there's much more to integrated care than treating mental illness. And uh, often the patients didn't keep their appointments and there were a lot of barriers to care. So that was before. Um, what happened was we, we had a dream about having an integrated care model and the Nicholson Foundation put out a request for proposals two years ago inviting practices to apply for grant money to learn how to deliver integrated care along the lines of the Cherokee Health System in Tennessee. And so we were fortunate to receive that grant and that allowed us to receive um, a year's worth of training from Cherokee and to incorporate their model of care into our practice. Um, so what's the difference between the co-located model that we had and the integrated model that we have? Well, the behavioral health clinicians, they are part of our care team. So a patient comes in for a visit, and in the traditional model, they interact with the receptionist, the med tech, the physician or nurse practitioner, and maybe are discharged by a nurse, and now there's a behavioral health clinician there. And it's seamless. The behavioral health clinician sits in the workroom with the primary care team. If a patient needs to be seen, you turn and you say, hey, I have a patient who scored such and such on the PHQ-2 score or an anxiety screening um, tool we use, 
or a substance use disorder tool, or the patient mentioned to the receptionist that they were feeling really depressed because somebody died, um, or they have an uncontrolled chronic medical problem. It doesn't matter. Um, any of those things, the behavioralist is sitting right there, and you just say, can you go see the patient? You give them a couple of sentences about what the issue is, and then when they're done, they come tell you what they found. And, um, <clears throat> you know, at that point, um, the intervention that is co-created um, can lead to follow-up with the behavioralist or with the primary care provider or both. It just depends. So, for instance, I've started patients on antidepressants in the past where I felt like they needed to be seen in two weeks to make sure there wasn't an increase in suicidal thoughts, but now they can come back and see the behavioral health clinician, or they can come back and see me, or if they have medical problems, they'll just come back and see both of us. It, it doesn't matter. It's seamless. And um, as one of my colleagues, I don't know if she wants me to mention her name, but I will. But anyway, Dr. Schneiderman um, is one of our internists, and what she says is that she doesn't like ask the patients, do you want to see the mental health clinician? It's not really a question. They came for primary care, and this is part of primary care. So she just, you know, in the appropriate situations, just brings the behavioral health clinician into the room and says, here's one of our team members. Um, she's going to talk to you for a little while. Um, how we got from co-located to integrated um, was a bit of a journey. Um, you, know, you know, like any other process improvement or change in anything, not just healthcare, it requires people to reframe how they're thinking and people generally resist change. So we needed to spend a lot of time working with our clinicians and our team to you know, explain why we were doing this and, and what was the benefit of doing this. Um, um, to help the process, we, uh, we have morning huddles, and so we wanted to make sure the behavioral health clinicians were at the huddles so that they could advertise what they were doing. Um, in the beginning, the behavioral health clinicians, they had to kind of screen through the charts and look for patients that they thought were appropriate candidates um, you know, because they weren't necessarily getting the referrals or the warm handoffs. Um, and so they would, they would do what Cherokee refers to as perching. They would just be there and listen in. And uh, in the internal medicine room, the residents are presenting to the attending. And so they would listen and they go, oh, I should see that patient. And, you know, now, now it's not as necessary for that. They're, they're busier. Um, just wanted to share a few outcomes. It's, it's a little bit difficult to measure outcomes, the kind of outcomes we'd all like to hear. Like I'm sure you'd all like for me to say, here is a graph showing that control of diabetes has controlled 30% because we addressed it. It's really hard to do that. We have so many new patients coming in with diabetes and people going out and you know, to get that data together is difficult. But I can tell you that um, in the last year, um, the BHCs are seeing about, on average, 80 patients each per month. Um, we'd like it to get up to about 100, a little bit over 100. Um, 286 patients have been uh, diagnosed with depression from our practice, 233 of which um, have had visits with the behavioral health clinician, and 30% of them are on antidepressant medication. So I, I think those are, are pretty uh, dramatic numbers. Um, they, the behavioral health clinicians have been involved in addressing certain aspects of chronic health problems, particularly patients who need to be given a new diagnosis that's uh, painful, like a cancer diagnosis or even a new diagnosis of diabetes, and often you see the primary care people bring them in uh, for those visits as well. Um, and then, of course, um, at the recommendation of our partners, UBHC, we included a community health worker in our integration program, and that health worker is extremely busy addressing social determinants in terms of food access, utilities, prescription access. And so I, I definitely um, think including community health, the more behavioral health assessment you do, mm -hmm. the more you learn about social determinant issues. And you don't want to be in the situation where you identify problems and then you can't do anything about them. Um, brief comment about the economics of it all, because that might be on somebody's mind. Um, about half our patients have Medicaid, and currently the status of, um, of payment by Medicaid in New Jersey is that 
LCSWs and LCADCs um, can be reimbursed, reimbursed for their services um, by Medicaid. At, at federally qualified health centers, we're paid by the visit. Um, so we have an annually negotiated rate with the federal government uh, for reimbursement. It doesn't matter what we code the visit, a visit's a visit. And so when the BHCs see a patient, it's a visit and we get reimbursed for it. So the collection rate for the Medicaid population is very high. The other half of our patients are uninsured and we just do it. Um, but it's working out okay. Um, revenue um, per quarter per BHC is between 14 and 20,000. I'm not giving a vague range. I just looked at the quarterly finance report and it went between 14 and 20 um, over the quarters for each BHC. So, you know, if we can get the visits up a little bit more and get it to be more consistently 20, um, it comes close to covering the salary of the BHC, um, other than the fringe rate, but anyway. Um, and we have, uh, and we have, sorry, and we have several grants that currently support the program. We have, um, as I mentioned, the Nicholson money and then um, federal dollars um, for increased access to mental health and substance use disorder services. Um, and the last thing I just want to comment on are some of our current challenges. I would say our number one challenge is space. So we're, we're seeing, you know, the patient's in the room, the team comes to the patient. We don't, ha we never had enough rooms where, we, you know, over at the health center and now throwing in an added service um, just leads to um, a lot of frustration about where the BHCs are gonna see patients. And it's been very tempting to use the space in the back of the building through the locked door at the end of the hall, um, but we've really resisted that because um, out of fear it's gonna undermine the integrated process. So we all work in crowded conditions and do the best we can. Um, and then timing is the other one. It seems like it's feast or famine. The BHC can sit there for two hours and it just doesn't happen that there's someone to see. And then suddenly four providers want them to see patients, including siblings who are suicidal or something. And it's just hard to do that, but that's part of open access and integration. Um, and then the last one is just, I think the mindset of our primary care team is mostly toward um, the mental health side of it. And so reinforcing and reminding that they're there to address behavioral issues for chronic health problems um, will require some additional, you know, reminder work. Um, but, and um, I am gonna step away, but I'll be happy to answer questions later. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Stan Evanowski. I am the uh, outpatient director for uh, Monmouth Medical Center, and I also am the director for our district project, which is the Integrated Health Home. It's not a home, it's a clinic, but I'm gonna take you through our little journey. Um, this is something that's very passionate to me, and I think to Jen, I know for yourself as well, in the journey that we took with this. In 2012, we at Monmouth Medical went for a grant through SAMHSA, and that grant was looking great. We were going for an integration at our Pollock Clinic, which is our behavioral health outpatient clinic, and we thought we were gonna just kick you know what with it. We had, everybody was in favor of it, except we didn't have one very, very specific thing, and that was the electronic health record. And without that electronic health record, it was dead in the water. At that time, we were number eight on the list for going to the electronic health record that we currently have, which is Cerner. So we said, all right, we'll put it on hold. We know we have a great project. We know we have a great model. And then all of a sudden, I'm on vacation in 2013, and I get this call from administration, and they say, Stan, you're the guy. We want you to work on our district project. I have to be honest, I said, Dip what? And they looked at me and they said, DISRIP. I said, this is the Delivery System Reform Incentive Payment Program. Okay, what does that mean? Well, I don't think anybody really knew what it meant, other than the fact that there was money available for certain projects to be done in our state through charity care dollars. And we had at stake for the system about 14, 
system being Monmouth Medical Center and Monmouth Southern Campus, about $14, $15 million at stake. This was a pay for performance demonstration project through CMS. Okay. So I come back for the meeting and they said, Stan, you're going to be in charge of this integrated health home for the seriously mentally ill. I said, awesome, because that's what I want to do. I want to service this population more than anything. What is the seriously mentally ill? Well, it's those that are diagnosed with schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, major depression, bipolar disorder, and really just about anything in between that you can think of. And the reality of it is, is that what we address with those particular patients is that we address the whole person, which is a first for really our system and something that I think we really need to do. And we really are addressing the whole person. How do we do that? Well, let me take you through a little bit about who we serve and about our demographics. And then I guess I'll end it from there. So who are we? We're an interdisciplinary team working closely and collaboratively, providing integrated care and wellness services for the whole person. That's our philosophy. We're a team of nurse practitioners, medical doctors, licensed clinical social workers, uh, mental health professionals, substance abuse counselors, BA level case managers, pharmacists, and everybody else that's out there. Um, the IHH Integrated Health Home Service Area is for Monmouth and Ocean County. Our demographic, based on what CMS said to us, is we have to service the low income population, the Medicaid and those that are underserved and indigent. Not surprising that that's a good percentage of the seriously and persistent mentally ill population. Our population, I think, is, Frank had said, averages uh, a lifespan of 25 years less than the average American. And you know what's funny about that, which really isn't funny, is that that has been said. I've been a social worker for over 20 years. That's been said all during my lifespan of being a social worker. And I hate to say it, it's almost like this. You almost got to a point of accepting it, but we don't. And this program has proven such. Our population needs a supportive space where they can discuss each factor impacting their ability to thrive. That we do. Our population currently represents approximately 3% of the general population. It's not a lot, but yet they're the super utilizers of the system. Over 44% of the Medicaid spent in this, in this state has been on these super utilizers. Our services and interventions. We do a timeliness of treatment through an integrated assessment. That integrated assessment is with the entire team. The patient comes in, they're welcomed. We get them in within three to seven days, and we actually try to get them in within 24 to 48 hours. But CMS holds us to the seven days. Now, when I compare this to the general outpatient that I also run in Pollock Clinic, we can get our patients on the schedule in seven to 14 days, but we cannot guarantee that they're going to show up. In fact, what we see is we see anywhere between 40 to 60 percent of a no-show rate. That's not shame on the patient. That's shame on us, because we have to do a better job to try to get these patients in for treatment. We do person-centered treatment planning. We use one treatment plan. We do psychiatric evaluation, medication monitoring, a medical evaluation all in the same day. We do a pharmacy assessment, medication reconciliation, enhanced case management through our case managers who are called community health workers. And in all due fairness, they are dealing with these patients around the clock. They are going to their homes. They're meeting them in the community. They're doing, to me, they're the heroes of the team because they're keeping those patients engaged, which is the most important piece to this. We do uh, wellness referral telephone calls from our access center. So not only is the patient being, being uh, seen by our community health worker and the rest of the team, they're also receiving calls from our access team Usually, we do it on a tiered system based on their, their, their uh, risk level. So for instance, a level three risk, which is a high risk patient, 
would be called as much as three times per week in addition to the visits from the community health worker and the rest of the team. We do daily huddles. Every morning we meet with the entire integrated health team and we also consult with our FQHC. We go into our FQHC and we meet with the FQHC sometimes as much as four to five times a week. That never happened before. We would get our patient come in through the regular polyclinic. DMHAS only required that you had some contact with the medical, which was, okay, you make that attempted phone call, you send a letter to the, to the, to the provider, and you're covered. Not really well as far as care goes, but we're covered, and that's how a lot of us looked at it, unfortunately. We also do a lot of assistance with concrete services. Homelessness is a huge problem throughout the state, but in Ocean County and in Monmouth County, it's particularly bad. There just isn't much of it there. But we do the best we can to try to work with our social services department to try to get our patients housed if possible. Uh, we do crisis intervention. We do family-centered uh, family interventions. We have patients that have been alienated from their, from their families. We do everything we can to try to bring that back and build that bridge back so that they're starting to communicate with their families again. We've shown success there. We do supportive counseling, urgent psychiatric and medical care appointments. In the morning during our, during our huddle, if the patient had an overnight event or didn't respond very well to our, to our wellness call, they're put on the schedule and they're, seen, and they're seen the same day if possible. How do we get them there? Our community health worker will go out, pick them up, and bring them in. We also are looking at uh, trying to, we work very closely with our inpatient and with our PEST unit, our psychiatric emergency screening services. One of our metrics that we're trying to do is we're trying to get our patients to not utilize the EDs, to not be put back into the hospital. And, you know, we're doing a really good job with that. But on the fiscal end of it, we sometimes get, hey, you know what, you're doing too good a job because they're not coming into the hospital. Well, we are doing that good, and I'll share that with you in just a few uh, moments. Uh, we're also doing long-term services for those chronic stressors. Uh, and again, we're doing a tier-based treatment. I want to give you some of our outcomes, just so you can. So over the course, we took our first patient October 6th of 2014. Since that time, we've had 2,000 patients enrolled. We have an active caseload in each site at Monmouth Medical Center and at Southern Campus. We have uh, a total of 300 patients current. Our rate of attendance to first appointment is 95.7% with a 2.8% no-show rate. That's unheard of. It's also very expensive, and I'll, I'll get into that in just a second. Current psychiatric and medical appointment adherence average over the last six months is 91.8%. Our rate of patients seen within the seven days of discharge of the referral to our program is 90.2%. Our rate of readmission within 30 days of IHH admission from 2014 to present is 7.5 percent. Because we're a pay for performance model, we had to prove ourselves through the metrics. And it's not just our behavioral health metrics alone, it's through the entire hospital system. We have brought to date about $56 million back to our system in both Monmouth Medical and Monmouth Medical Southern Campus. Again, earned dollars is what it was. It wasn't guaranteed dollars, it was earned. So we look, I'm gonna give you two different metrics. One is our inpatient utilization data, and the second will be our uh, ED utilization data. So overall, the average IHH inpatient utilization rate for 2015, bear with me, it was 10.4%, 107 uh, of our patient, inpatient admissions. Our average caseload during 2015 was 102. Overall average IHH utilization rate for 2016 was 5.4%. 
104 inpatient admissions, with an average caseload of 161 patients. Overall average IHH uh, inpatient utilization rate for 2017 is 1.6%, 28 inpatient admissions, with an average caseload of 148 patients. And current state, our IHH inpatient utilization 208, uh, through 2018 is 1.0%, with only 13 inpatient admissions. Again, it's proven that it works. As far as our ED utilization, for 2015, it was 17.9%. In 2016, it was 8.4%. In 2016, 9.8%. And then as we get to current state, we're looking at 3.1%. I mean, it's just incredible the amount of savings there. So somebody asked me the other day, Stan, how expensive is it to run this program? Okay. Not cheap. But that's including the fact that we had to build our infrastructure. We had no infrastructure to really go with. We had to build it. So it cost about $1.1 million per program for salaries alone. And then you add in the operation costs. But when you look at the fact that if you go with the four years, five years that district has been operating, you take that cost and you look at the money that the hospital has earned back, I'd like to say, with the healthier lives that we've earned here, I think that it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good uh, metric that we have and the savings for the hospital. The only other thing I would say is that the key with this has been true integration. And it's been able to have these interdisciplinary team meetings on a daily basis. Without doing that, it doesn't work. And you're able to talk, as the doctor said here, we're able to talk at the same time to each other. And we're learning. And then we're able to say, hey, you know what? That patient didn't look well today. Let's get them. Now, our goal is to try to embed this into our outpatient program. And I believe we can do it. We have already an infrastructure of, of staff there. But the key really will be, Jen mentioned that we're going to have these integrated care regs through the Department of Health. The caveat that I say is, that's great. That's for the Office of Licensing. But what is Medicaid going to do? Hopefully, Medicaid will follow suit with lessen, uh, loosening their law as far as regulations, as far as being able to see these patients and get, billed, uh, get uh, reimbursed for them. Because currently, we're, again, we're a paper performance model. So we are earning this money based on our metrics. But if we were to take this outside of that, we don't really have a lot of billable units right now. The community health worker is the key, and they can be our cheapest yet most enhanced way of helping these patients, and that's what we're hoping we're going to be able to build. So thank you. Hi, I am Dr. Laura Budnick. I am a uh, psychologist by background and training, actually a school psychologist originally, uh, which to my mind is the integrated position um, in terms of if you think of a school system, the school psychologist is the person that's there to help the student with some behavioral health problem learn in a teacher's classroom. So talk about integrated, that's kind of my entire background and training and my passion. So. Um, I work at Newark Beth Israel Medical Center, one of the RWJ Barnabas hospitals in um, Newark, and we're located in the south ward of Newark. Uh, probably better than 90% of the patients that come through um, any one of our programs is covered uh, by Medicaid or Medicare as their, their payer. So when you talk about social determinants, and the folks who live in our community, they use our services routinely. Uh, they use our emergency department for a number of reasons, as well as their primary care, their behavioral health crisis, uh, their, their routine wellness. They'll come through our emergency departments. So our mission is really to get our community into primary care settings, into outpatient settings to manage their day-to-day 
and, and keep themselves well over time. And, and that has been our mission as long as I've been there, which is about seven years. About three years ago, our CEO, who happens to have been born at the Beth, and a huge um, mission toward the people of the community, he is from there, uh, came to me and said, could you please design an integration program? Sure. <laughs> um, I had an outpatient clinic, three inpatient units, a psych emergency room, and a mobile crisis clinic. And to me, integration was, how hard could it be? We have primary care settings. We have pediatric settings. I have all the outpatient providers. And I, we can get this done. It's easy. It was not. Um, there is a, a notion that if you put the right people together in the room, the care will just unfold. So I will tell you, uh, there is a huge push um, to want to have integration programs, and, and they're needed. But when you actually get the people in the room, it becomes very cumbersome. So I'll tell you some of the things to be aware of. Our programs exist in our pediatrics department and in our primary health care center. They're different from each other because the needs of that population differ. So in my pediatrics department, I have a navigator and I have a psychologist. Those two people were new team members to the pediatric team. When you introduce new members to a team, there's a process that they have to go through naturally. So we tried to figure out who does this well and let's follow their model. So we all packed up our bags and we traveled over to Montefiore and um, they do this service. They've been doing it for now 13 plus years, then 11 years, and we walked through their day with them. They were similar in us in size, scope, population, social determinant issues, and they had a stellar program that we decided we're gonna start with this and see how we go for pediatrics. Um, and it was great. Um, what we needed and struggled with, another member said, space. You need to find a space for this person to sit. So originally, people become territorial. Okay, you can have that room way down there through the locked door. There's a window in the room and you can put a plant. Um, and that was the original design. And thankfully, our head pediatrician knew it can't work that way. He cleared out the exam room that was in the center, moved that exam room down to that space down the hall, made that the other exam room, and he put the psychologist in the center of the action. We scripted uh, for the team the way to talk about the new team members. So it wasn't, hey, I want you to see the psychologist. It was, there is a team member of mine that is expert in some of the things you've described to me today. I want to bring that team member in. So it wasn't the psychologist or the social worker or whomever, it's this behavioral health. This is a member of my team. With that, the integration new staff people had to learn that they were not there as the expert on this child. They were there borrowing on the trust that the family was putting in the pediatrician. And they had to respect that that was the relationship they were entering before they tried to establish their own. That's the difference between co-location and integration. You are borrowing on the trust of that provider and they need to see you as a member of their team. That's an evolution. It doesn't happen because some spreadsheet or some located location of your office. That happened over time. So that's my PEDS program. One psychologist, one navigator. The adult health care center, we had a licensed clinical social worker, the navigator, and we put in originally a full-time APN because we thought for sure that APN would be utilized, um, psych APN would be utilized fully. And what we found was it actually deterred from the patient seeing the primary care physician in a way that was partnering with the behavioral health staff because it was kind of a total team. So we removed the APN as a full-time person and put in maybe eight hours a week as a consultative role for medication management. The licensed clinical social worker became the team member that would come in and out of the office and work with the primary care physician and create the plan of care together. And that seemed to work better. Again, this took about two years to evolve into the way we're practicing now. So we do have some hours of a psychiatric APN that can consult with that primary care physician on the proper medications and management. They can do a direct consultation or they can do it 
um, separately. The licensed clinical social worker is the person partnering, borrowing on the trust of that primary care physician and creating the relationship with the patient through the team. Our outcomes have, um, we've measured things from no-show rate, which are far lower than my outpatient department. Our no-show rate can be as low as 15 to 20 percent. And that's from the first appointment all the way through. These patients join in a way that um, it doesn't feel intrusive. It feels like it's a natural course of treatment, and they engage. The use of the emergency department by the patients that are in the integration program for the past year we've monitored that, it's been zero. They don't go to the emergency department for either their psychiatric needs, their crisis, their medical problems. They are very integrated into the care that they're getting through that primary care physician. Um, some of the benefits of the child work, how many of you um, actually have had children sent out of school, sent to an emergency room for some sort of psychiatric clearance so that they can get back into school the next day? Yeah. So when they're involved in integration or they're involved with that pediatrician, we can actually do a much better job of partnering, establishing care, and then seeing them ongoing. In an emergency room, you can clear them, they can go back to school, but there is really not any sort of integrated follow-up of what got them there to begin with. So it's enhanced a service we weren't even expecting it to enhance, and that's the whole school piece for the, the kids in the district. So cost, we have been the benefit, uh, we've been the beneficiary of the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey. Uh, they funded us two years ago, and um, they have continued to fund us. Uh, we do bill for services, unlike um, what Stephen described for the FQHCs, we do rely on codes. And a lot of the time what we see may not rise to the level of a code for a billable service, but because we have this funding, we're able to provide that level of care anyway. Um, and that is really essential for population health. If it's going to be a fee-for-service model, integration can get cumbersome. In a pop health model, you really can't make it work without integration. So as the model shifts, you'll see more and more integration just become par for the course with the way we design our programs. Resources, just as a final note, um, as you are building your program that works for your community and your office and your setting, um, be mindful if you start to tease apart, well, this resource goes to the medical part, this resource goes to the behavioral health part, you'll never really achieve that team um, integrated spirit because as resources decline, now people look to kind of fend for themselves and keep their own. So if you keep resources even, like your registration person, um, the processes that you train people to work within, the electronic medical record, those resources should be even um, among the program and not divvied out among the provider by the type of care they provide. Well, we'll be here for questions after, and I look forward to hearing from you. So good afternoon, I'm, I'm Al Talia. I'm a professor and chair of family medicine and community health at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. And it's a pleasure to be here with my esteemed colleagues to uh, talk a little bit about what, what's been going on in New Jersey. You know, it was Churchill, I think, that said that those Americans would always do the right thing after trying everything else. And here in New Jersey, we've been trying everything else, but it's really good to hear from my colleagues uh, and from all of you that we're actually finally um, going to actually get it right around integrated uh, behavioral health and healthcare as a whole. So I'm going to tell you this story, it'll be a short story, um, about um, one of the programs we've, um, we've experimented with um, at our uh, Monument Square office in New Brunswick. Um, to tell you a little bit about that office, um, it's uh, basically uh, an office that has about 32,000 visits a year. It, uh, the patient population is, um, we're told by the insurers, the largest population of Rutgers uh, faculty, uh, staff, and families in central New Jersey. Uh, so it's a fairly well-insured population. But we also have pockets of, of special populations, adults with de developmental disabilities, the chronically mentally ill, um, 
students, and a whole variety of other folks. But by and large, um, it's, a, it's a diverse population. Um, and, and about 11 years ago, building on what was 10 previous years of research in our department, our department uh, conducts effectiveness research. Does, not a question of does it work in a very black box efficacy type of, of, of box, but does it work in the real world? Uh, does it really work out in, in, in the diverse and chaos that exists um, in, in the community? And the patients that we see are, are not patients specifically with diabetes, or they don't come in for hypertension. They come in with diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. They're going through a divorce. Their kids are on drugs. They're about to lose their job. And you know, once in a while, they, get, they become homeless. So it's really the, the myriad of, of social, psychological, and uh, biomedical problems that exist uh, in all populations. So we, we had been at about 1,500 practices in the United States looking at um, what works and what doesn't work in terms of improving the quality of primary care around the country. And what we saw is some of the things that you heard earlier. Patients don't necessarily make it from referrals to, uh, to behavioral health providers. Um, they actually prefer to have a lot of their, their care delivered in a single setting with a trusted agent usually the primary care clinician. And um, putting all this together, um, as well as looking at some of the models that existed out there, about 11 years ago, our um, director of uh, behavioral health in our residency program, the other thing you should know about Monument Square is the family medicine residency teaching site. And for those of you that don't know, family medicine residencies have requirements in terms of the curriculum around behavioral health care, have always had that. So integrating behavioral health, at least from a, from a competency knowledge standpoint, has always been part of the training. But our director of behavioral health, who was one of our, happened to be one of our researchers as well, Dr. Lynn Clemau, uh, working with our then um, um, program director, Karen, were you program director at the time? Dr. Karen Lynn, who's our assistant dean for global health, and others, um, Bob Like is in the audience, I saw him too in building on previous research we had done said, you know what, let's try something different. Let's put, let's start with what was a, initially a co-located um, program, and Lynn was able to get the Rutgers Graduate Program of Applied Psychology to send interns. These are folks who had graduated from um, the, the program and were now doing internships to come to our office and help take care of some of the patients. Um, so initially, it was very much still a siloed model, but over the course of the last 11 years, we have actually worked to create more of a, of a, a cooperative group model, team-based care, so that there is, there is training of both the interns as well as the family medicine residents and faculty around uh, issues. So we see not just problems typically seen in a primary care setting of depression, anxiety, et cetera, but we're also targeting those, those conditions that are precursors to uh, chronic disease as well as premature mortality. So smoking, um, alcohol abuse, physical inactivity, and, and, and diet. So this program has been ongoing. It's been very successful. We share a medical record, which has absolutely been key because we're all part-time physicians um, because of residents have inpatient rotations as well as other outpatient rotations and all of the faculty have other responsibilities as well. But, but the thing that we share in addition to the patients, of course, is the medical record. And that's been really, really helpful in terms of the communication. So we've gotten things like huddles, joint conferences, all these things have evolved over time into a true, I believe, uh, integrative model. So the question comes up, well, does it make a difference, right? And, and so about two years ago, um, Chancellor Strom had put together a, a working group uh, with uh, the largest uh, insurer in the state, Verizon, who happens to be the largest um, insurer for the state health benefits program. Remember, that that's basically our, our patient population. And we started to say, all right, let's take a look at this program. Does it actually make a difference uh, from a cost perspective, obviously, number one, but number two, from a quality of outcomes, right? So um, uh, Horizon was gener generous enough to fund a, an ongoing research project that is 
currently in its beginning of its second year, looking at whether or not the outcomes uh, in a particular cohort of patients would actually be different from the rest of the population. The cohort is the top 5% in terms of cost uh, and conditions, um, morbidity, right? And we're now into the beginning of the second year, and the way it's working is we are putting those patients in what we've been basically doing all along, which is have that integrated care model um, so that they're seeing the, the uh, family physician clinicians as well as the, the uh, behavioral scientists, which in this case happen to be clinical psychologists. And the preliminary data that we have, and that's going to be co compared to a similar cohort that basically does not, is not in this program. So the preliminary data, I, I can only give you uh, some anecdotes at this point, but number one, first and foremost, guess what? The patients like it. Uh, not that we should ever let that determine what we do, but, but they really do. Um, and um, I can't tell you the number of, of um, folks that I have uh, placed into this program that have said, you know, this is so important. The stigmaization, unfortunately, there's still stigma in terms of use of behavioral health services around the country is removed because they're just going to see their family doctor. And yes, there are other, other folks who are involved in the care, and it's a wonderful thing. So that's removed, that's improved. So patients like it. Preliminary data are some folks with very serious chronic conditions actually find that it mitigates their symptomatology. Caregivers, right? None of us exist. Um, in islands, we're surrounded by a, a social network. If we're lucky, caregivers find it. It's tremendously helpful, and that's another important thing. So I would say as we go forward, it's going to be important not to just measure the usual things, utilization and, and all those other things that are, are financial, but how does it affect the patient? How does it affect the patient's family? How does it affect the communities that, that uh, these patients live in? So. Uh, I promise to be brief, and I, I've given you two extra minutes, uh, Frank. Here you go. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Denise Rogers. I'm Vice Chancellor for Interprofessional Programs at RBHS. And, um, I want to spend a few minutes talking about some of the important principles and skills that are necessary to optimize the delivery of integrated primary and behavioral health care. I think of myself as the fine print of this talk, but hopefully I will not be boring fine print of this talk. Of our, of our panel today. Um, as many of you know, I spend a lot of time uh, working to teach students how to become skilled members of interprofessional uh, healthcare teams. And as you might expect, integrated care is best delivered in the context of a clinical setting that fosters the development of highly collaborative teams. Individuals cared for by integrated teams are often very complex patients as they present with multiple medical issues that are confounded by their mental health and or substance use issues. Not infrequently, these patients present to the clinical setting with behaviors that can be disruptive, that can provoke anger in the staff who interact with them. Drug-seeking behaviors can contribute to a climate of mistrust that can result in a loss of a sense of safety for the staff and for other patients. Patients with poorly controlled psychotic disorders can engage in behaviors that other patients may find distressing when sharing a waiting room. Depressed or anxious patients may not feel comfortable in confiding with their providers, but may confide in the reception staff or the nursing staff. For this reason, for all of these reasons, a team-based approach to care is critical, so everyone is on the same page in terms of how to deal with some of the behaviors that these patients present with, but also everyone is on the same page about the need to communicate effectively about what's going on with patients in a holistic manner. In 2010, the World Health Organization defined interprofessional collaborative practice as follows, quote, when multiple health workers from different professional backgrounds work together with patients, families, caregivers, and communities, to deliver the highest quality care. 
In 2011, a national organization representing six health professions released a document that was entitled Core Competencies for Interprofessional Collaborative Practice. Interprofessional team-based care is defined as, quote, care delivered by intentionally created, usually relatively small work groups in healthcare who are recognized by others as well as by themselves as having a collective identity and a shared responsibility for a patient or a group of patients. The IPEC competencies were updated in 2016, and the revised competencies tell us the four, the four most important qualities team members must exhibit. One is we need to work with individuals of other professions to maintain a climate of mutual respect and shared values. You would think we wouldn't have to say this, but for those working in healthcare, you know it's critically important that we say this. We need to use the knowledge of one's own role and those of other professions to appropriately assess and address the healthcare needs of patients and to promote and advance the health of populations. We need to communicate with patients, families, communities, and professionals in health and other fields in a responsive and responsible manner that supports a team approach to the promotion and maintenance of health and the prevention and treatment of disease. And we need to apply relationship building values and the principles of team dynamics to perform effectively in different team roles to plan, deliver, and evaluate patient population-centered care and population health policies and programs that are safe, timely, efficient, effective, and equitable. Because the fundamental underpinning of all of our work must be quality as described in those six name aims from the IOM. In 2014, SAMHSA, the SAMHSA Center for Integrated Health Solutions issued a report entitled Core Competencies for Integrated Behavioral Health and Primary Care. This report identified nine core competencies that are critical to the provision of high quality integrated care, and they're gonna sound a little familiar. Obviously, interprofessional communication is the first. The ability to establish rapport quickly and communicate effectively with consumers of health care, their family members, and other providers. Collaboration and teamwork. The ability to function effectively as a member of an interprofessional health team that includes behavioral health and primary care providers, consumers, and family members. And one of the nuances I want to call out here is that different professions call patients different things. So in the behavioral health space, we talk about consumers. Those of us more medically grounded talk about patients. And all of us need to talk about people with whom we are partnering. Screening and assessment is the third competency, the ability to conduct brief, evidence-based, and developmentally appropriate screening and to conduct or arrange for more detailed assessments when indicated. We need to do care planning and care coordination, the ability to create and implement integrated care plans, ensuring access to an array of linked services, and the exchange of information among consumers, family members, and providers. The fifth is intervention the ability to provide a range of brief focus prevention treatment and recovery services, as well as longer term treatment and support for consumers with persistent illnesses. The sixth is cultural competence and adaptation, the ability to provide services that are relevant to the culture of the consumer and family. The seventh is a systems oriented practice, the ability to function effectively within the organizational and financial structures of the local system of health care. Brian and Barry are particularly interested in us doing that. Systems-oriented practice, I'm sorry, patient-based learning and quality improvement, the ability to assess and continually improve the services delivered as an individual provider and an interprofessional team. And lastly, informatics, as has been discussed earlier, 
the ability to use information technology to support and improve integrated healthcare. The adoption of the IPEC and SAMHSA core competencies within the Rutgers RBHS RWJ Barnabas system will allow us to develop metrics by which we can measure our effectiveness in delivering integrated care and in creating clinical environments that are conducive to the workings of highly functioning collaborative interprofessional teams. Clearly, everyone benefits from team care. Teamwork helps prevent health professional burnout, and it allows patients to benefit from the knowledge and skills of a variety of team members who are committed to working together for the benefit of the patients and the families they serve. So in summary, our goal is to deliver integrated behavioral health and primary care in the context of both primary and specialty care environments that provide high quality interprofessional team-based care. Thank you. What is a terrific, and then Jen, if you'd come up as well, you want to come on up too. So we're going to uh, open this up for questions um, first, but then we also are going to encourage some dialogue among the staff. So we'd love to hear either questions or thoughts from the audience for the folks that you've just heard from, please. If you all speak at once, we, we can't hear actually. <laughs> And you all do that, so. That thorough. Yeah, please. Oh, okay. great. Good morning, afternoon. Uh, I had a question for the uh, offices of integrated care. Do you find that patients are reluctant to actually see these care providers, especially if you do introduce them? You know, you had that issue. Can you now uh, talk to this other person about it? Do you find that patients are reluctant or they're more open to actually engaging with them? Okay, please. So, so the patients that we see at Newark Beth in the integrated program are the mild to moderate um, presentation. So part of the way they get identified for us is they fill out a screen uh, while they're with the first nurse, the first nurse that they see when they come in. So the screen starts to prompt them to identify some of the issues and then when you say you want to have somebody on the team speak to them about these things, it's kind of a natural progression. So no, there's not reluctance. Um, and if there is, then we would just take that opportunity the next time they showed up. So there's always an opportunity um, and we just, we bring it when it's naturally uh, likely for the patient to accept it. Stan? Yeah. So what we were saying initially when we were making the decision to do an integrated assessment, we had to look at how much time that was gonna take because we're talking about multiple disciplines we're t and, and then we added a pharmacist as well. So initially it was taking way too long. It was taking well over two hours and the patients were getting very uncomfortable. It was hitting our patient SAT scores and what have you. And we had to really listen. So we changed it up and we're able to get the patient in and out in about an hour and 40 minutes. But something else happened, and that is, is that the patients that are in the integrated health home actually enjoy what they call the TLC treatment. In fact, it was an, we overheard some things in the, in the main waiting room where our HH patients stay with some of the Pollock patients, and they were saying, how come you guys get the special treatment and we don't? Which I thought was kind of interesting, yeah. But, Overall, the patients seem to be responding well to the integrated care. So I, I couldn't agree with you more about, especially about the fact that um, screening or treatment for behavioral health care is not a switch that you can turn on and off. Um, borrowing from an experience I've had in my previous life at Montefiore, we've uh, done an integrated um, maternity depression screening and treatment program. Um, but with, with the notion that we know that it's 
first of all, there's a lot of false negative, I think, in, in depression screening. So we've done a series of work, first of all, looking at you know, what's the best way to screen. We actually found out that for a certain population, maybe in the millennials or younger generation, uh, technology is, is not only as effective, it could actually be more effective and reliable in screening positive. So what, what we did was, and we wanted to, to screen for maternity and postpartum depression, but again, we, we knew that there's a lot of stigma, reluctance, and, and, and potential barrier to accept care. So what we did is we call the Trojan horse strategy. We created an app that is really about pregnancy, really um, advocating the, 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 the positiveness of pregnancy, healthy eating, but then embedded within those delivery is, is the importance of behavioral health, sleep, and other healthy habits that may impact um, stress and mental health um, exacerbation. So throughout a duration of you know, 40 plus weeks and, and postpartum beyond, we were then able to develop a trust with the, with the patients, and in this case through an app. But the trust is really about, this is not just you know, screening and, and pulling you out because you, you uh, are phenotypically or, or behaviorally different. But this is really about, this is just a normal part of care. And we've, we've demonstrated that our positive screening rate just twice as much as twice as much as a in-person provider-led um, screening. And uh, we have an over 80% of enrollment rate through our program. Please. Yes. yes, Bob Like from Family Medicine and Community Health at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Thank you to the panel. I have a number of comments, but I'll just start first with a general question. Uh, and to preface it, one of, there's a quote from one of my spiritual mentors that goes something like this, sometimes it's easier to change the world than to change oneself. And I raise that because I'm curious about the panel's comments about how we deal with stigma, bias, and resistance to the integrated biopsychosocial model of care. In the CL, Constellation Liaison Psychiatry Literature, there's a classic article that we hand out to the medical students about why is it that you might be uncomfortable dealing with behavioral health issues. And so I'm wondering, how do we prepare ourselves, both as a workforce, but as an institution, to really do this integration? I'm going to pass you this down now. You got it. All right, I think we're on. Well, Bob, I can always count on you to ask the most provocative questions, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, so it's really good that you did ask that question because the reality is um, health care providers are not islands, right? They are human beings like everybody else and they have their own prejudices, biases, and a whole host of other um, happy baggage sometimes, not so happy other times that they take with them. So part of the training that has to go on is um, there was a clinical psychologist in our department for many years, emeritus professor, talked about the BATHE technique, uh, which is uh, basically a technique for assessing the psychosocial state of the, uh, the individual. And she also developed with you, I believe, actually a, t a term called auto-BATHE, which means we have to assess ourselves and how we're doing, right? Because if we don't know where we're, what our starting point is and, and how we're dealing with with the same stigma issues, all the, all the other issues, it's very hard to get into an effective communication pattern, which is absolutely necessary to get to the point that you raised, which is do people actually get, resist going to see um, behavioral health providers that are part of a team, even in, embedded within, within a primary care practice? And the answer is yes at times, right? Because people come with all kinds of you know, behaviors and beliefs. Uh, you're not saying I'm like, crazy, am I? Are you? Uh, um, you know, see, so, so the communication approach has to be, is something that has to be learned, as well as the reflective approach in terms of where we are, and where we're starting from, also has to be learned. And I'm happy to say that that's something that we, we try to teach our family medicine residents as a skill set to actually accomplish. And I think it can be learned across all different dimensions of healthcare providers. So the good news is education works, um, but it does take time and effort. 
please. Uh, my name's Keith Lewis. <clears throat> I'm an anesthesiologist, probably the least likely person to ask a question in this room, <laughs> but maybe the most important person to ask a question in this room, that if we have um, 325 million people in the United States and 300 million people have an operation every year in the world, and of the 300 million, 50 million have complications, and of that 50 million die, um, as we push patients towards hospitals, I guess I'd like to say, how can we pull them out or clients out of the hospital and really be more preventative? And I think we focused often on the community and the health there, but how can we start changing this and working in a research environment, uh, really teaching our patients to be healthier? And maybe we have PCPs and we have PCHPs, which are procedural community or health physicians called surgeons. And maybe our recovery room should be populated with behavioral you know, health people, because I think of the 12 million people, there's the large number that die as a result of social determinants and going back to a community in an unhealthy situation. So I think we often focus on the healthy, but I look here in this scenario that we really have an enormous population. Basically, every person in this country has an operation if you pick our population a year, which is kind of scary because of that number, probably 50% of them don't need it. So I look here to say I think we have an enormous opportunity moving forward to really work with population health to identify those people, to prevent those people that don't need surgery, that die as a result of it. So I look for new partnerships moving forward. Thank you. Denise? So um, I think one of the things that I would encourage us to do, uh, particularly in light uh, of our opening speaker who talked about social determinants of health is to recognize that many of the solutions to the problems that face our patients are not in this room. And that we need to be the people actually who are more willing to talk about the need to end poverty in this country. We need to be the people who are more t willing to talk about the need for housing and adequate education and food. And we're actually not the best people to do that. There are a lot of people in communities who have spent their entire lives working on addressing social determinants of health. Why does it fall into our ballywick? Largely because of how much money is in our ballywick. So we partner with community-based organizations because they see us as being the people who have the money to do this work. I think the other thing that we have to recognize is that in the sphere of behavioral health and, and mental illness, we're not that good. And I can say this clearly as a primary care physician, we're pretty lousy at getting people to quit smoking. We're pretty lousy at getting people to lose weight. We're pretty lousy at getting people to take their meds as they should. And we're also pretty lousy at getting people to exercise. And so one of the reasons that we avoid doing some of these things is because we're not very good at it. And we don't like to do things that we don't like to do. So the good thing about surgery, actually, is, is that you sort of go in and you cut it out, and you're like, oh, hey, I did this, right? And then as the <laughs> anesthesiologist, you know, you put them to sleep, you wake them up, they wake up, you're like, hey, I did this, right? I'm awesome, right? And so there are these moments in people's lives, Vince totally can relate to this, there are these moments in people's lives where we do these incredibly heroic, life-saving things, right? But that's not mostly what the majority of people need. And what the majority of people need it becomes very challenging for us to do some of those things well. And so what have we figured out? Part of what we figured out is that in the integrated space, we figured out that as a primary care clinician, I can do this a heck of a lot better if I have a behavioral scientist right there in the space with me to partner with me in working with this patient. And remember this key language is we're partnering with people. Because the other thing we get into is this mindset of I will do this to you. Doesn't work so well. None of us like to have things done to us, unless of course we need that life-saving surgery, then Vince does it and we're all great. But the bottom line is for most of our lives, we want people to partner with us. And to do that well, we also need a broad team of people to work with us in caring for patients. And when we're really good at what we do, we also look outside of the walls of the healthcare system so that we partner with food pantries and we partner with organizations that help people get housing and we partner with 12-step programs that exist in the community to help our patients with their substance use disorders. And so that's, that's part of it is it's really, really, really important that that part that belongs to us that we do really well and do it at the highest possible quality. 
but it's also important to not be so arrogant to think that we're the only people who can do really important things to help the lives of the patients that we need to serve. My, uh, my favorite quote about behavior management change came not from a physician or a psychiatrist, came from uh, Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, who said, habit cannot be flung easily out the second story window. It has to be coaxed down the stairs one step at a time. And that's, that's the big issue. You're working, a lot of what's killing people today, uh, unfortunately, are not dysentery and, uh, uh, you know, um, Ebola. It's how we live. It's choices that we make. It's, it's decisions that we make every day when we get up to either do or not do things. And so writing that script, last time I looked, I think the average script that's written in America by a physician is followed exactly as written about 38% of the time. Um, and that's whether you're talking about an antibiotic or, an anti or hypertensive medication. So I think that behavior change is what you're talking about. Other questions? Oh, Sam. Oh, yeah, please. Yeah, Sam. so one of the things in, in our program that we noticed more than anything was as clinicians and as, as social workers working with our patients, we have this interdisciplinary team that meets every day. The missing component to that team often is the patient themselves. So what we've tried to do is put that patient in the forefront and we make the statement to our teams, the most important partner to this team is the patient themselves. We have to hear it through their voice. We had a joint commission survey, I don't know, I think it was in your place, Laura, where they criticized us for something that, you know, your documentation on your treatment plan is not in the patient's words. And I remember thinking, well, they're right. <laughs> That's all. Can I, <laughs> last, please. can I make a statement around the inpatient um, comment? Uh, that there are two, two, two words, right? Integration and transitions of care. So integration, as, as we've said before, integration can take place in, in multiple settings. Um, one area that I, I think probably um, lags behind a little bit more than the ambulatory setting is integration of behavioral health care in the inpatient setting from screening and to, to actual treatment. How many times, right, as, a, uh, as someone on Pop Health reviews admission notes, you know, 36-year-old, CHF, MI, diabetes, type 2 uncontrolled, blah, 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 schizophrenic, blah, 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 and then that's it, right? But we all know that likelihood is that that schizophrenia condition is really driving all the other conditions, and yet many times patient at best get a psych consult at the inpatient. So we need to do a better job in really integrated true care during the inpatient stay. The, the second piece is transitions of care. That is really where we still don't do a good job. And this is also when the opportunity is to make sure that when the patients are in transition from care settings, that we are teeing up all the care teams that this patient has in the outpatient setting to make sure that all the proper follow care are followed, including behavioral health care. It may be close to the end of time. So, Jen, did you want yeah, to? Yeah, I think Frank will finish us out. I just wanted to end this piece of it with where I started, which is I think the word in all of this is relentlessness mm -hmm. in, in culture, in language, in billing, in inter interdisciplinary teamwork, in all of it, integrating care and really addressing the needs of a patient beyond the clinical needs as we discussed some of their social determinant issues and bringing that together in a patient-centered way requires a relentlessness that I'm thrilled that we heard today really, you know, incredible examples of how that is happening. We just need that, that to happen on a broad scale. And that relentlessness, I know we're committed to pursuing, but it is a slog. It's a slog, and it's not just in New Jersey, it's across the country. This is something you really have to be committed to, but thankfully we are, and I really am thankful to the panel for hearing such incredible examples today of how I think we're really beginning to achieve that goal. Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Jen, for the uh, ability to be able to partner on this. Uh, and also, look, one more time, let's thank the panel for their. <laughs> well, this has been a, a terrific opportunity to showcase something. I want to thank you for taking time out of a really busy day to come and be a part of this. We look forward to the continuation of this series over time. And, and folks may, may dawdle for a little while after if you want to catch up with somebody before you leave. Thank you so much for coming. Have a great rest of the afternoon.